What's up guys? Today we're going to take a quick look at probably the best bang for your buck home theater processor, the Motiva XMC2. I think it's probably the best value because you're getting 16 channels of processing with fully differential outputs across the front three channels as well as the subwoofer outputs. It's got Dolby Atmos and DTS-X on board and the thing only costs $3,000. Add a couple Emotiva amplifiers and you've got a killer system. Now before we unbox this guy, if you're new to the channel and love home theater gear, then tap the subscribe button for new weekly videos. Okay, let's see what's in the box. Inside, we get the birth certificate, the remote control, calibration microphone and the calibration microphone cable. Accessories box 1 contains the microphone stand, USB stick, FM antenna, antenna stand and trigger cable. Inside accessories box 2 we have the power cord, the batteries and here we have an AM antenna. Size-wise, the XMC2 measures 17 inches wide by 15.5 inches deep by 5.75 inches high, and it weighs 22 pounds. Taking a closer look up front, you'll find a 3.5mm headphone out jack, a USB input, and a 3.5mm auxiliary input. In the center is the menu, power, and dimmer buttons. And on the right side is the volume knob. Moving around back, you get four audio-only inputs with one being balanced and three being unbalanced. There's a Zone 2 pre-out next to a coax and optical digital out. All 16 channels are XLRs, so there are no RCA pre-outs for any channels. You'll have to get some adapters for that. Here's a few trigger outs, an IR in and output, LAN and USB ins, and there are eight HDMI 2.0 inputs and two HDMI outputs. Now I did grab the URE3 rack mounting kit, which retails for 39 bucks. All you have to do is remove the two lower screws, then screw the mounting hardware back on. Do the same thing to the other side and you're done. For setup, I'll be pairing the XMC2 up with a pair of Macintosh amplifiers. I'll be using a Zipidi MIDI player and a Kaleidoscape for movie playback. I'll also be listening in my dedicated theater space with identical B&W speakers all around. I've got a RHEL 1205 subwoofer up front and an SVS PV16 in the back. You can find links for everything used in this video down below in the video's description. Alright, I'm not going to go over all the settings since they're basically the same as what's inside the RMC1. If you want to check that review out, you can find a link for it down below in the video's description. What we will take a peek at is the speaker setup. This is where you'll define what output does what. For the two left and right subwoofer outputs, you can set them up as Dolby enabled, top middle, small middle, none, single mono, or dual mono subwoofer outs. Here you can change the crossover slope at either 24 or 12 dB per octave. Here you can change the height channel outputs. If you set your speakers to small, you can adjust the crossover from 40 to 250 Hz. And under speaker levels, you can change each speaker in 0.5 increments. So that's just the basic speaker configuration options. Okay, now we're going to set up Dirac room correction. First thing you're going to have to do is grab the Dirac kit and plug it into the back of the XMC. You'll have to take the short Ethernet cable and plug it into the back of the XMC2. That then plugs into the included switcher. Grab the other cable and go from the switcher into the Raspberry Pi. You're now going to need your network cable from your modem or your router and plug that into the switcher as well. Grab the AC adapters and power up both the Raspberry Pi and the switcher. 
If you're wondering why you have to use a Raspberry Pi, it's because the internal processor in the XMC2 uses different code than the Dirac Lab calibration tool. So the Pi is used as a translator and does all the calculation externally. Once all measurements are done, they're stored on the XMC2. Now, if you want, you can disconnect the Raspberry Pi and store it away, or you can just leave it attached. Next thing you'll have to do is go back into the settings and enable Dirac. Now you'll have to either plug in the included calibration mic, or if you have one of your own, you can plug that into your PC or your laptop. There is an Android or iOS app available, which I didn't try, so I can't say if it's as good as the PC version. If you've tried it, then leave a comment and let us know. Once the mic is plugged in, open up the program and it should find the XMC2 right away. Select the microphone you'll be using, in my case the UMic1, and click Proceed to Volume Calibration. Click on the play button until you see that all the levels are in the green area. If the channel is too loud, you can use the slider to lower the volume. Once you get that situated, click on Proceed to select arrangement. Here you're going to pick the type of space you want to measure for. There is tightly focused, which is for single listening if you're going to be by yourself. Focus, which is a little wider, and then there's wide, which will measure for a larger area, up to 17 points. I'm going to pick focus, which is only 13 points. Next, place your mic roughly in the same spots as in the picture and click measure selected position. You don't have to measure all the points, but it is recommended for the best results. It's also advised that you keep the microphone between one to two feet between each point. Once you're finished measuring all the points, click on Proceed to Filter Design. On the right side, you can see that the speakers are paired into groups. The first group here are the lower surround speakers. You can select them individually, or if you hold down the control key, you can select the speakers together. Now you can click on any one of these points and give the entire group the same curve. If we go down here to where it says Curtain, you can slide these two endpoints to either expand or limit the amount of correction that you want applied. Now this does come with the full frequency version of Dirac, so you're not limited to only up to 300Hz. I know on the NADs that I reviewed, you'd have to pay an extra $100 for the full version, so it's pretty cool that it's included here at no extra cost. If you want to check out the impulse response, you can click on the tab up here. Once you're done, click on Export Filter. Choose one of the three slots and give it a name. Click on Export and it'll save over to the XMC2. Now before we go ahead and give it a listen, I want to give the subwoofers a little bump on the low end. I'm just going to follow the natural curve and raise it just a few dB. After it's done calculating, we'll just save it in slot 2. So now when you're watching a movie, you can have a different preset for the type of material that you're watching, and you can just switch back and forth. After you get your measurements saved, you're going to have to go back into the settings and disable Direct Live. Scroll up to Equalization and select the preset that you just made. I did all of my testing on the XMC2 using movies. The first title I threw in is one of the best Dolby Atmos mixes out there, Gravity on standard Blu-ray. If you were here in person, you'd be able to hear each character moving in 360 degrees around the seating area and above in the top channels. There is also a good amount of space debris that zips through different speakers. Now one thing you should listen for is how well the voices travel as they move through each channel. If you've got your levels right, there should be no gaps between speakers, and one shouldn't draw more attention to itself than the other. So Doc, now that you work for NASA, 
How do you like it? Like huh? I was just happy that they didn't cut the funding to my research. How long was your training? Uh, six months. Including holidays? Mm -hmm. so. Now, even before turning on room correction, I've always thought the Emotiva did a fantastic job of rendering each effect very cleanly. So it was always easy to hear certain effects, whether they were in the lower or the height channels. Activating Dirac makes those same sound effects in this case, the characters' voices, become more prominent and giving dialogue more distinction. Therefore, it's easier to follow each character around the room. Another thing you'll notice is that the bass seems to tighten up and sound less bloated. If you listen to the rumble while Sandra Bullock is using the drill, it should sound kind of boomy at a very low level. When Dirac is engaged, it becomes less bloated, which brings the other effects into focus. For me, I felt bass was toned down just a touch too much. That's why I made the second preset during the measurements. I gave the subs about a 6 dB boost, which gave me the added extension I wanted while still keeping things distinct. The extra bump doesn't always sound good on certain movies, so it's a good thing you can keep different presets. Should we, should we be working? Explore, give it to cargo bay. Mm. So Doc, now that you work for NASA, how do you like it? The next demo I threw in was the subway scene in Joker. I remember seeing this at the theater and loved how big and cinematic the score was. There's also some great background effects that should transport you inside the subway train. Now I'm not trying to knock AVRs, but once you get into a nice quality processor, there's nuances and subtleties you'll start hearing extracted from a well-crafted film soundtrack. Things I heard, such as the train's wheels moving on the track, the passing train on the left, space and atmosphere, the door opening and closing, and of course Patrick Bateman and his friends getting blown away. When the music kicks in, the Emotiva does an awesome job presenting the haunting cello during the bathroom scene. It's clean, it's well defined, and blows the soundstage outwards, giving that big cinematic theatrical experience I heard at my local theater. For sheer surround sound and development in all directions, I think Midway on 4K Blu-ray takes the top spot this year. You'll be bombarded from aerial attacks in the high channels with an insane amount of low frequency attack from your subwoofers. I found the handoff from the speakers to the subwoofers to be executed wonderfully, although you may have to go in and fine tune your response if you're running multiple subs. Keep in mind, at the time of this video, multi-sub calibration isn't available yet, so you may have to do some manual tweaking. That said, speaker to speaker movement was spot on. You should clearly hear planes fly from the front stage, over top, and disappear in the back channels. Just like the Joker soundtrack, Midway has a grandiose mix, and the XMC2 should make your speakers nearly vanish. This is an aggressive Atmos mix, and the Emotiva had no problems placing the sounds right where they should be. At the time of this video, the XMC2 retails for $3,000. Just like many of the processors that came out this year, the XMC2 had its fair share of issues. One issue I had was a small pop that would occasionally happen coming through the speakers. If there was nothing playing or if a video was paused and you started the video back up, there'd be a quick little pop or crackle that would happen right before the sound kicks in. It doesn't happen all the time, but you'll definitely hear it when it happens. Give it to cargo bay. Give it to cargo bay. Another very minor bug I noticed is the volume level bar that pops up on screen. I'm pretty sure you were able to raise the volume in 0.5 dB increments. Now it seems you can only do it in 1 dB increments. Sometimes the 0.5 would show on screen, and other times it won't. Other than these two minor bugs, I didn't have any other notable problems. I'm positive they can fix these issues with the new firmware update. As I would mentioned earlier, Emotiva doesn't have the direct bass control available just yet. 
I'm not sure when it'll come or if it'll be included in the price of the XMC2, but if it isn't, keep in mind Dirac does charge an extra fee to activate the feature. For a single sub, it's 350. For more than one sub, it's an extra 500. So you might want to consider that when you're deciding between the Emotiva and a different brand. Another missing feature that you might be worried about is the absent HDMI 2.1 support. I have been told that this can be upgraded in the future when 2.1 becomes more of a necessity. So in the meantime, you'll have to keep all your 8K movies and 4K 120 video games on the shelf for the time being. All that being said, as far as the XMC2 being used to control my home theater, I found it to perform right at the top of the pack alongside some of my favorite processors. NAD and audio control come to mind. It does fall short from my reference Trinoff Pre-Pro as far as your clarity and precision, but it isn't too far away. I found surround effects, whether it was on the lower or high channels, to be very audibly distinct, which elevates the bubble of surround within a well-mixed movie soundtrack. If you're contemplating between the RMC1 and the XMC2, and you don't think you're going to go beyond 16 channels, I say save yourself two grand and get the XMC. Sound quality wise, I honestly couldn't tell the difference between the two. I know it doesn't have all the bells and whistles as some of the other bigger commercial brands, but sonically, I think this blows those guys away. So what are your thoughts on the Emotiva XMC2 processor? Have you heard it and how do you think it stacks up to the competition? Leave a comment and let us know. Now if you want to pick up the XMC2, I'll leave some links for it in the video's description. As always guys, thanks for watching. If you found this video useful, then give it a like. And if you're not a subscriber, then tap the subscribe button. And we'll see you guys again in the next video.